when in, in 19, no, 2003, I think it was February 1st, uh, the, the uh, spacecraft um, Columbia broke up into uh, um, a million pieces as it re-entered the Earth's orbit. And seven astronauts were on uh, that ship at that time. President Bush addressed the nation shortly. And in that short address, he said, these astronauts knew the dangers and they faced them willingly, knowing they had a high and noble purpose in life. Now think about that high and noble purpose. And we come today and we have witnessed baptism what a, what a glorious expression of the victory that Jesus gives us and of the changed life that he brings to us. But we're also going to observe the Lord's Supper. These are ordinances. These are not um, sacraments. We do not believe that they hold special power in and of themselves. We don't believe that a person is saved because they go into the water and that they're baptized. We believe that that is a outward expression of something that's already happened in their heart. And so that's why we celebrate baptism. But also the Lord has given to us um, another way to remember him, and that's through what we call the Lord's Supper. Um, others believe that, uh, that the bread and that the juice of the wine itself uh, actually um, changes in its uh, consistency and actually becomes the body and the blood of Jesus. We do not believe that that is what's taught in the scripture and we do not hold to that but we do hold to that it is a reminder for us it is the ordinance that's given to us to remember that Jesus went to the cross and all that he endured that his body was broken for a purpose for us and that his blood was spilt for a purpose for our salvation so we're going to be here today remembering that we have a high and noble purpose in life what is our purpose in life why do we celebrate what Jesus has done for us uh, if I if I had to bring it down to one verse I would say Romans 8 29 we all know Romans 8 28 for all things work together for the good to those who love God and who are the called according to his purpose for many of us that's a favorite Bible verse but verse 29 holds for us our purpose it says for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that's our purpose is to be conformed to the image of his son a little bracelet some still wear WWJD what would Jesus do we are here, and that is the definition of godliness. See, we are here to be conformed and to be changed into the image of Jesus. Whenever you're having a struggle, ask yourself that question. Is this what Jesus would do? Is this the action Jesus, is this the attitude, that, is this the response or reaction that Jesus would take? And you learn your purpose. And we as a church, as believers that we have an authorized work that Christ gave to us. It's found in Matthew 28, verse 19. As you go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're called to do, is to carry the gospel where we go. As we go. That if we're living to be conformed into the image of Jesus, and as we go, that we carry that gospel message. It is difficult in our day and time to fulfill the purpose that God has placed us here. It is difficult to carry the, the message in our culture. And sometimes we like Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me just sort of walk through the Christian life if I may. When we get discouraged, this is what he says in verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God, not of us. We're, we can't do it. God can do it. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus and the life of Jesus also, who may be manifested in our body. We, we do have difficulty in doing it, and sometimes we get discouraged like Paul was. And sometimes we are at war with our enemy. Ephesians 6 and verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. <coughs> that you may be able to withstand in the evil of our day, having done all to stand. So we fight. So how do we fight? Being conformed in the image of Jesus, carrying out the gospel, that we are not, we're not going to be crushed. We're not going to allow a time of uh, disappointment or a time of discouragement uh, come up against the, the very uh, gospel message where Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail. But sometimes we have to fight. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, it says, Though we walk in this flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So how do you do that? Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I've sort of walked through the Christian life. We come with one purpose, that we trust Christ, that we come in faith, that we believe, and that our purpose from that point on is godliness, for us to be conformed into the image of Jesus. Whenever we do that, then we know that living in this world, that we're going to have enemies it, it maybe not on Sunday morning, you don't feel any threat, but there are people all over, the, all over the world when they come together to worship, they do feel the threat. But we feel the threat not from flesh and blood, but from our culture, from every thought, from every vain idolatry that there is in this world. And it wars against us. And now how do we war back? How do we fight back? How do we move forward? How do we be conformed in the image of his son? Is that we put on the whole armor of God. We stay in his word. We renew our mind. And we remember what Jesus has called us to do. I'm calling you to arms this morning. I'm reminding you that we are called to carry this gospel message out of this building and share it with people. Not, not in anger or hatred, we, we share it with them because we love them. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and all that is within you. And love your neighbor as yourself. How can you not love yourself? How can you hate yourself? Well, we can become really warped sometimes. So we know that's not healthy. Well, it's not healthy for us to hate our neighbor either. Look at them not just from what's on the outside or what they say with their mouth sometimes, but see their heart, that they are a lost soul and that the only hope for them is going to be found in Christ, in Christ alone. So as we think about how we live in this culture, we are a very mobile society. Everybody's busy. Parents have a schedule. Do you have a schedule before you can agree to do something that you got to look at your schedule? You got to find out what you signed up to do. And most of us, that we, uh, we've got multiple things. We have to look every day if, if we're going to schedule something. But if you're a parent here, not only do you have your schedule, but your kids have schedules now. You have to schedule everything about it and make sure that it's all going to fit. We are a mobile society. We have come with great advantages. I mean, we have computers, you have in your pocket or in your purse or some of y'all in your hand, you hold a computer that has more computing power than NASA had when they sent the first uh, rocket into orbit. You, you have convenient... Um, what, what would you think, if I were to ask a question, don't, don't everybody say it out loud, but if I ask the question, what, what's the greatest invention in, since the Industrial Revolution? I mean, a lot of things come to mind, computers and smartphones and all those things. There is a, uh, a Swedish professor who makes the argument uh, that the washing machine, now the washing machine, we take for granted sometimes, don't we? Uh, 
First washing machine was uh, invented by James King in 1851. Hamilton Smith in 1858 got a patent for a rotary version of it. And then in 1868, Thomas Bradford, who was a British inventor, uh, he came up with the washing machine basically that we have now. It's been around for a long time. Um, some of us do remember the rub boards and even the, the uh, that, that you feed your clothes in to wring them out. You best not get a, my, my sister got her finger caught in there when she was little, so when she'd point her finger, she'd be pointing over there. <laughs> she, she'd point at me anyway. Um, but he says this, he says that it's the greatest invention of the Industrial Revolution. It enabled women to turn a boring wash day into a day of reading. So next time that you think how boring your washing machine is, be thankful for your washing machine and think about what it gives you freedom. Uh, we've got a washing machine now. We've got washing machine and we've got uh, Alexa. Uh, somebody the other day I said, I've got three women in my life now. Leanne, Alexa, and Siri, uh, that I, I talked to those women. Uh, Alexa will announce in our house, your washer is done. And uh, so I'll be sure Leanne can hear that. Uh, but we do, we live in that mobile, easy society, but it is more difficult now to get things done than probably any culture, any time, because we have crowded out the important things for the things that feel urgent. When that phone rings, it feels urgent. You've got to answer that phone. No, you don't. I'll tell you here a while back, I felt just great freedom because I went off from the house and left my phone at home. And for that first 30 minutes, I thought, oh man, I left my phone at home. And for the rest of the day, I said, oh man, I left my phone at home. So yeah, I was in trouble when I got back, but it was a great day anyway. We live in such a busy culture, we need to be reminded of things. And this morning, that's what we're gonna do. The church at Corinth, is an example for us of what not to do. Did you ever have that friend that your mom or dad said, you see them, don't be like them. That's the church at Corinth. And yet the church at Corinth may resemble the church of our day and time more than any other church in the scripture. Because they were a church made of people who lived in a culture that was anti-God, that lived in a place that didn't know God, and it was hard to live for Jesus. And they demonstrated it. In chapter 11, I'm going to read in beginning in verse 17. Listen, if you want to just kind of get a picture, this is Paul writing to them. Listen to what Paul says. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Uh-oh. <laughs> For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. Do you kind of get the message? Paul a little upset with them? Uh, I can imagine why Paul's writing it. His head doing all this whenever he's writing them. He's got an attitude whenever he's writing them. I, I am ashamed of you. I'm ashamed of the way that you're acting. And sometimes those need to be the words we hear. What they were doing at Corinth, they would come together and they would have a potluck. They would have food. Well, those who were wealthy or those who weren't indentured servants or those who weren't slaves, they would get there early and they would eat everything. And then they would even eat what had been set aside for them later on to have the Lord's Supper together. And so when those others who had to work for a living got off of work and they got there, they didn't have enough to bring. They didn't have 
They, they didn't put anything on in the crock pot that morning. They, they didn't have anything cooked. They, they came there and they didn't have anything and they couldn't even partake of the Lord's Supper because all greedy gut had already eaten up all the stuff, all the elements for the Lord's Supper. Paul is ashamed of them. You're, what he's saying is you're, you're, you're not treating each other well, but you're missing the whole reason of why you come together. You come together not to be served, but to serve. Jesus told his disciples, in the world, they lord it over you, those who have authority, but among you, it should be quite different. Those among you, anyone who wants to be a leader among you must first be a servant. Jesus gave us that example. You remember that night there whenever he was betrayed. They were all in the upper room and Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant. He did what the slaves did. He said he got down on his hands and feet with water and a towel to wash their feet. Now in their culture, they would have had servants to wash their feet when they got to a guest home. They would wash their feet whenever they would come home because they walked on a dusty road, either barefoot or in sandals. But Jesus came to do that. You remember how weird that made the disciples feel? Peter, Peter said, Lord, you're not going to do this to me. You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, then you're none of mine. He said, well, then give me a bath, wash my hair. And Jesus said, you don't need a bath. You need your feet washed because you've been walking in this world. But your soul has been cleansed. He said that by faith of what was coming up. As Paul talks to the church at Corinth, let his words come to us. We know what we're supposed to do. We know how we're supposed to live. We know how we can be saved. And if you don't, just let me share with you quickly that we're all sinners. We, we are all sinners. And the Bible says that because of our sin, that we, the wages of sin, the payment for our sin is death. It's eternal death. It is for us ever to be separated from God. And the Bible says that we are all in that shape. That is our sinful nature we inherited from Adam and Eve. But the Bible says that God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. And the scripture says that if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. That's how we're saved, by faith in Jesus. But sometimes our church takes on the very characteristics of our, of our life every other day. And we get busy and busy and busy and busy. And we don't take time to stop and think about what we're doing. I know I tried to find the original place uh, to quote it but it's in so many places and you probably said it in your own life where you tell somebody, don't just sit there, do something. Well, this morning I want to come and say, don't just do something, sit there. I want us to pause just for a moment this morning and prepare our hearts to remember the Lord's body and blood for this to be something that is more than just a tradition more than just the Lord's Supper, but a time when we are at the Lord's table with him. Before you can act, before you can just do something, before you can get busy, well, let me, let me just pause right there. Yesterday, we had a work day. I appreciate Brother Jonas organizing, and uh, I bet I heard Jonas's name a hundred times. Have you seen Jonas? Where's Jonas at? Because Jonas was keeping everybody on track and he had what we needed to do. But I appreciate we had many, many folks who came for the work day yesterday and we got busy around here. And uh, if you walk outdoors and you see clean and you see shrubs cut and things looking nice, uh, people were busy up here yesterday morning. So I appreciate it, Brother Jonas. And then, uh, and then, Brother Jonas is up here just about every day doing things. So things don't just happen. Uh, there's somebody that has to do them. And so we have a lot of folks. So I'm thankful for the action. But now, before you get busy, before you act, before you do something, you have to pray. The Bible teaches us that prayer is presenting our 
Not just our want list, but presenting our heart to Jesus. Now, I know that I've given my heart to Jesus. I've given my life to Jesus. But every time I pray, that's what it ought to be, that I give myself to Jesus. It's not just for me to tell Jesus what I need him to do for me, though he does want to hear from us. But it is our expression to say, here I am, Lord. Send me. What do I need to do? How do you need to change me? What do you want from me today? What can I do to serve you today? Lord, speak to my heart. James chapter 4 and verse 2 says, You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. We need to just be still and pray. And open our hearts, not not to tell God, but ask him, what does he need to tell us? There's a story that's told over in the book of Luke chapter 10. I'm not going to read the scripture, but it's of two sisters in Bethany. And Jesus came into their home. Their names are Martha and Mary. And, uh, And Martha was the doer. She was the one that got things done. And she was in the kitchen. And oh boy, she was... She was busy about making supper for Jesus and those 12 motley crew that he brought with him and Brother Lazarus and for all the people who came. So she's in there and she is busy in the, in the kitchen. And then there's Mary. And Mary sits at the feet of Jesus and she soaks in every word that he speaks. And Martha comes in, and I mean, her head was really going. She had that hand on the hip and she was wagging that finger and it was pointing right at Mary. She said, Jesus, I'm in here slaving away in this kitchen. Tell Mary to get up and get in here and help me. I need some help. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha. When you were a kid, if you heard your name called twice, what did that mean to you? Martha, Martha. You you could have just fixed a casserole. Martha, Martha, you're busy about many things, but there's only one thing you need to worry about. And Mary is at that place, and I'm not going to take it away from her. Listen, I enjoy casseroles. I enjoy cooking and food. Tonight, we're going to have a church fellowship. You don't have to do, you don't have to bring anything. It's going to be a fun time. But we got some talented folks around here. We really do. And sometimes we don't have enough opportunities to be able to share that talent. And so tonight, have y'all seen uh, America's Got Talent? Have y'all seen those kind of shows? We will have First Baptist Has Talent. And we're going we're gonna to hear some good stuff. We're going to hear some... Not so good stuff, too. So it's going to be fun. We're going to cook hamburgers and hot dogs and all the, you know, trimmings. Uh, So I hope you'll come. That's going to be at 530 over in the Fellowship Hall. And we're going to have a good time. Uh, By the way, experiencing God class that you're going to meet here in the sanctuary in the choir loft uh, at 4 o'clock. So so it's going to be a fun afternoon. I hope you will be here. But you know what? Yeah, there's somebody that's going to be cooking the hamburgers. You're cooking the hamburgers, aren't you? Yeah. We're going to be somebody cooking the hamburgers and hot dogs and people getting everything ready. But you know what? There are times when we just simply need to sit down and do what Mary did. We sit and we just soak in and that we hear, that we pray. Don't just do something. Sit still. Pray. Before we pray, we have to come to that point to recognize that I believe not in myself, but I believe in Jesus. And he can do in me, he can do for me, he can do with me anything that he wants to do. Prayer brings you to that attitude. But before you can pray, you have to be still. Solitude is where we find our power. Solitude, you need to have a place every day where you get alone in solitude. Now I know that may seem impossible, but it's not. I'm not talking about spending a whole day, but I'm talking about you need, to, you need to start your morning, as hectic as it may be, of just pulling away 
from the world, preparing yourself for the day. And the only one who can do that for you is the Holy Spirit. So practice solitude. Even before you can pray, you need to get alone, just you and God. Sometimes that may be the car. Sometimes, uh, I'll be honest with you, our family worship sometimes uh, when my kids were little would be that last step just before you open the front door to leave for the day. And it was just bow your head. Lord, thank you for the day. Y'all be careful. Remember who you are. I mean, I know how busy and hectic families can be. But before you can really pray in your heart, you got to be alone. You got to come along with God. You got to spend that time listening to God. Uh, Letty Calman's book, uh, Springs in the Valley, um, she was given an account of whenever she first arrived in Africa and there were, um, there were people that hired out to be able to carry, transport their stuff. And this is back in the day when it was, everything was done on foot or, or by animals. And that first day, they, they got up so early and they traveled so far in that day and it traveled into the night and finally, so the next morning she was dreading getting up and going and then and she got up and she was the only one up. They were all sleeping in and then they wasted half the morning just sitting. And so she finally asked them, don't we need to be on the move? And they, this is what they said, oh no, we traveled so far so fast we have to wait for our souls to catch up with us. Do you ever feel like that? That you have traveled so far so fast that you got to wait for yourself to catch up with yourself. Sometimes you feel like you meet yourself in the door, don't you? Well, I'm telling you spiritually, there are times that we need to just pull apart from the world. We need just that moment to let our self to catch up with ourselves. Psalm 37, 7 says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Wait on the Lord. Don't just do something, sit there. Isaiah 40 and verse 31 says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Don't just do something, sit there, pray. But before you can pray, get alone. And actually, before you can get alone, you got to be still. Do you surrender to our Lord? Is that the heart and your attitude? Whenever you come in prayer, whenever you come in worship, that you give it up, you surrender to the Lord? And sometimes it is just that still, quiet moment when you surrender, that when God speaks to you. Now, I know he can speak. He can turn the Red Sea back and hold it back. He can come in the great glory with, uh, but you know, Elijah experienced something. That God told him after quite an ordeal, God told him to go out and listen. And the Bible says that First of all, there came this strong wind and, and he just knew God was going to speak, but God wasn't in the wind. And then he felt underneath the earthquake as it trembled, but God was not in the earthquake. And then a sweeping fire that came through, but God was not in the fire. But it says, but then a still, small voice. And he told him, you're not alone. You're not the only one. I've got thousands who haven't bent their knee to bail. But I'm with you. As Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he told them the danger of what they were doing, of not stopping and thinking, being still, to pray and to search their own heart and to be quiet and listen to God before they took the Lord's Supper. Not only that it was it disrespectful, but it was as if they were, they were making no effect and without any thought to Jesus shedding his blood and Jesus' body broken and said, you're guilty of the Lord's death. Well, every one of us is guilty of the Lord's death, but I don't want to do that every time I do want to think about what he's done. 
Every time we come together, I want to know of the victory that he gives. Every day, I want to experience the newness in my heart. And so what we're going to do right now is let's not just do something. Let's just sit there. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Allow this to be a moment of solitude, even in a crowd. Look in your heart. Be quiet before the Lord and hear from him. If you've got unconfessed sin in your heart, confess it now. And when we enter into the Lord's Supper, that we might think about what he has done for us. Father, we are grateful. We thank you that we can come and speak to you deep within ourselves. That, Lord, that you hear, but you also speak in that still small voice. Father, many have sat here in this moment of silence and find it strange and hard just a little strange to sit in a crowd and be quiet. Some even find it difficult to be still. But Father, I thank you that you meet us in that place. But Father, we can sit here this morning. We can let our soul catch up with us. We know that you are here. And you have something to say, not, not just through a preacher, but you have something to whisper into the heart of every person. For some, Lord, you may have convicted of sin, something that's going on in their life that they know they're not supposed to be doing or thinking or involved in. And so, Lord, you've given us that opportunity to confess and your promise is that if we confess our sin, that you're faithful and just, not only to forgive us our sins, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for forgiveness. Father, for some, you have spoken in our hearts to let our soul catch up. And Lord, we recognize it's not necessarily something that we've done, but Lord, it's something that we haven't done. Lord, we haven't been still. We've gotten out of the, the habit, the routine, the schedule without including you in it. When, Lord, you are the Lord, you are to be the most important and that your presence is supposed to penetrate all other things on our schedule. So for some, Lord, you brought that conviction that we need to include this every day, just to be still, be quiet, to listen, to renew our mind in your word, in prayer, but to expect you to say something. So Father, thank you for this time to confess our sins. Thank you for forgiveness. And now, Father, as we enter into the Lord's Supper, I pray, Father, that you will make this personal for each of us, for us to remember what you've done for us. In Jesus' name.